and years and years ago, all the fishermen, or most of them lived on the Stade, all very nearby. Obviously, they didn't have cars, and uh, many of them, they, they wouldn't go out under the arches. There's enough pubs along the Stade for them to frequent uh, if they went to drink. It was quite a close-knit little community down here and they didn't seem to have too much to do without people in the town. And they all helped each other in the most different ways, you know, to keep the business going. Nobody locked the front doors. If they did, it was on a, the key was on a piece of string inside the letterbox. So lock it out and in you go, you know. There were a few feuds, but when anything went wrong, they were all together, you know. Everybody pulled together then. Everybody helped everybody out. And I believe before our time, it was a lot better still. My sister and my mother and myself came back to Folkestone after the war. I would have been nine years old, so I remember Folkestone in its bomb state just after the war. My father always had boats for pleasure, and at nine years old I started going out fishing with him. At 14 years old I had a rowing boat and I used to put the odd lobster pot down. When we were at school, we used to mess about with nets on the rocks and lines, you know, when we could sort of imitate what the fishermen were doing, but always try to get out in a boat of some sort. You'd uh, take the boxes back to the boat for them or all odds and ends of jobs, you know, just to keep in, because you were interested in it. We were always here, there was nothing else to do. We didn't, didn't know anything else, didn't want to know anything else. I remember when I was a child, I used to explore all the little rock pools. So I used to go down with my mum, and we used to be fascinated by the sea anemones and things like that, and little little crabs running around in the rock pools. And I liked to go around the fish market when I was a child. I was always fascinated by their hose. They had a rubber hose with a spiral wire all the way round it. And I used to say to Mum, is it, is it a, a special hose, high pressure, it needs the wire to hold it together? She said no, she said they'd drag it over the floor and it would wear out in no time at all. Uh, it was a different world. Jack O'Fag, he was a longshoreman and he, he was bound on the beach and I bought his capstan off of him then on the beach to start using my boat around there, um, around about 1953. You know, I think he was late 70s, might have been 80 then. He, he went up to Hawkinge in a car, uh, just for a little, little ride around, quite recently, and he didn't even know Hawkinge existed. And he said, cool, I didn't know there was a town up here, he said. But they, you know, they lived such a sheltered, narrow life to what people do today. Folkestone was a lot, lot behind other places. I mean, they were a long while before they got winches. It was all hand capstans and God knows what. And when we think of it, what we got now, a little bit more sense, they should have done it. A very close community, you know, they didn't look to what other ports were doing. You know, we never renewed the boats until the 60s. Well, they could have started renewing them in 1945, straight after the war, with government money, but nobody nobody knew about it. You know, and th those that did know didn't want to do it. The 
I say, in 1961 I started, I left school in an open boat, catching wilts and uh, lobsters and crabs with Alfie Waller. And then in 1962, I went in the Fair Chance with Val Noakes and Skipper. That was that bad winter. Lovely lot of fish about, caught loads of fish up until Christmas when it started snowing and that was it for 16 weeks or so. We didn't do anything. Just had to go on the dole at 32 shillings a week. It started snowing in Boxing Day. You know, we had 16 weeks of really severe weather and the water was so cold that conger eels, they come up to the surface to breathe and they got caught by the frost and killed and one Dungeness fishing boat uh, picked up 80, 80 stones floating on the top of the water. And the first boat to go to sea, I think, after 16 weeks was Harry Sharp. And they caught one dogfish. The sea was barren and the seashore, there, were, there was no life in the seashore. They couldn't work. Well, we set up the fishing museum. Uh, it was Frank Bond's actual, actual idea. Folks had started off as a fishing, small fishing village, and we ought to have a fishing museum to remember it as a small fishing village as it started off. Well, it is a responsibility, but I enjoy it. I don't class it as a responsibility. <clears throat> and I really enjoy it, you know, speaking to the children and uh, sometimes get quite emotional. Uh, and it's good to see the expressions on the different children's faces. Mm. So we're just this inside. See this? Watch, watch the This is an old-fashioned fog all off of an old Belgian jaw. When it's thick fog. <laughs> well, we've joined Wheels of Time. That was the year before lockdown. And at that time there was 47 museums in in Kent that belonged to it, so we made 48. And so each museum that a child visits, I think between the ages of five and 12, they get a badge. And I think it's on their 10th badge, they get a bronze. Uh, 20, I think they get a silver, and then uh, the maximum, which would be all the museums, would be 48, they get a gold. We were really the last generation of any number of us going into the fishing. You know, we all went fishing, all the sons. That's all we ever done. You know, it was, that was the life we wanted to do. It's all freedom, come and go when you like. No rules or regulations. Share fishermen, you got paid on the share what you call. You know, it's a good life. I definitely would like to see more fishing come back to Fosin. Yeah, <coughs> the fleet's really in decline, but uh, the young people are not taking it up. They don't think anybody can come into it because of the cost and the rules. One of the fair chance of building 55, that cost 5,000 pounds. To have a new boat built now, you're talking a quarter of a million pound plus, because there's so much more safety gear, and electronics and hydraulics, and you know, there was none of that. I mean, when we started, we didn't have any electronics at all, all we have is a compass and a watch. We're, we're really in quite difficult times now. Um, the fishing industry could close almost overnight, I think, if it, if it um, isn't able to work more freely and, and operate and, and export our items as, as far as we can. Get a better home market as well, that's the other thing we need, more, more home consumption. What was the kind of Essex Sea Fisheries, which is now called IFCA? They've got dozens of staff. And they've probably got more staff in Kent than we've got fishermen now. They don't know what end, end of a fish from the other. They come straight out of university and get these jobs, and that's it. They don't know anything about the game. Well, years ago, the fishery officers invariably were ex fishermen. They'd never be the same, unfortunately, but we had, our, we had the best times, I think.